Good evening. How's everybody doing? I wanted to welcome each and every one of you to Self Care and You. This is an amazing program. We are all super excited to have you this evening. If you can just give us a couple of minutes uh, to start the program, we just want to make sure maximum number of you can attend it. So just two minutes and then we are going to start the program. Thank you. By the way, I'm Mehani Ismail. I'm going to be your moderator for today. So super excited. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Umehani Ismail, the founder of Ismail Law Firm and the Community Outreach Coordinator for Dowdy Boras in Houston. For those of you who've never heard of Dowdy Boras, let me take like two or three minutes of your time to introduce ourselves. The Dowdy Boras are predominantly South Asian Muslim community who follow the spiritual leader, Sayyidina Mufatal Saifuddin. They strive to play productive roles by enriching the societies in which they live throughout the world. They wholeheartedly participate in projects that contribute to the progress and development of the countries and all its citizens. With focus on hard work and education, many Dawdi Boras run successful businesses, they create jobs, generate wealth, and contribute to the growth and development of the nations. In Houston, we have around 500 families, and we congregate at Masjid al Muhammadi on Coventry Park Drive. It is an absolutely stunning and gorgeous complex, and we would love to invite you to come visit us if you are ever in that area. The community has many doctors, IT professionals, small business owners, educators, lawyers, scientists, and homemakers. The Dawoodi Boras um, established Project Rise. It is a worldwide global philanthropic initiative to help improve the lives of those in need. They work in partnership with the government bodies and local organizations around the world on projects such as water security, improved sanitation, alleviating hunger, reducing food waste, raising health and nutrition level among children and adults. Globally, Project RISE has started several initiatives for the benefit of local communities. Two amazing examples are one of them is um, a local enterprise called Happy Treads, which was started in Gujarat, India. It provided a web store for local women who were able to sell products that they handmade on that website. And the second and my favorite one is Dowdy Boras in Mumbai, India, joined a local environmentalist, Afrosha, in a much needed effort to clean the local rivers and beaches. Even in Houston, we have had several activities under Project RISE. Just last week, we were fortunate enough to be able to deliver food, water, basic necessities to individuals in need in the fifth ward. And we were accompanied by Mayor Sylvester Turner. We also helped individuals who were affected by winter storm Ori by providing hot meals to various shelters in the city. Rise Against Hunger has also partnered up with us in the past on several occasions to make food packages. Dawdi Boras, along with other neighborhood mosques and churches, do biannual cleanup in the community. And initially, when COVID hit us last year, and there was a grave shortage of masks, the community made hundreds of masks. And then we donated all the masks to the city of Houston and all the organizations that desperately needed these masks. So today, we have the honor of coming together with Anissa to present this talk, whose topic is a very, very important part of Project RISE. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to today's talk about self-care and you. COVID has changed our world and um, our life as we know it. 
in the past one year, we have been living in isolation and um, social distancing from our loved ones to prevent the spread of this virus. The isolation is stopped with uncertainty and fear. COVID has not only touched our health, but it has also impacted us socially, mentally, and financially. It has created a global state of uncertainty. And even with the vaccines available, um, we still don't know if we will ever be able to return to the pre-COVID world as we knew it. I mean, yes, it's sad, but it, it gets better, I promise. All of us, despite of all of our different backgrounds, have been affected by this pandemic at some level. I wanted to share my own personal experience with all of you today. So I'm an immigrant, like most of you, and I moved to US 18 years ago. Immigration process, if you ask anybody who has been in it, is going to tell you that it is very tedious and frightening. Having my own battle scars, I decided that I wanted to spend my life helping those who were not as fortunate as I was in the process. I became an immigration attorney and I started my own practice. I also volunteered in the community. I came in contact with Anissa through one of my volunteer projects. Um, being a mom of two gorgeous girls, I was blown to find this organization that did so much for women and girls in the community. So you kind of get the picture of my life and um, I think it's probably most of your life as well, right? Life was crazy for all of us. We were all superheroes that single-handedly dealt with bosses and clients and family and kids and orange theory in 24 hours and six inch heels. The best description I ever heard of somebody give to me about their life was, I feel like a juggler riding a tricycle on a thin wire while trying to keep a dozen flaming balls in the air. And I was like, sister, me too. Absolutely, me too. Once COVID hit, everything around us slowed down, but our responsibilities haven't decreased, have they? If anything, we are responsible for everything above, plus homeschooling children, taking care of our family, putting warm meals on the table, and shopping trips. Um, let's be honest about the shopping trips. They've started feeling like supply runs from the walking dead at this point. Our future generation are going to be talking about a brave, heroic, acts from the battle for the sand sanitizers and the toilet papers. We are not taking any time off ourselves, despite of being tired and exhausted. The worst part is we don't even sympathize with ourselves. We are our own worst critics, you know? We push ourselves to do more and more and more. The problem is that we are getting lost in all the chaos around us, you know? And so today we are going to change all of this. The first step we need to take is to recognize that yes, we have a problem and we are not okay. I think most of us have taken this first step by being here on a Sunday night to listen to this remarkable group of experts to help us. We have Dr. Naima Shah, Ms. Amina Shah, Dr. Ketam Hamdan with us today. So now I'm going to give the stage to Ms. to Dr. Naima. Take it away, Dr. Naima. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, I truly am excited to be here and this is such a relevant topic uh, with everything that's happening around us. Um, just a little bit about myself in brief. Uh, I'm a healthcare administrator. I've lived in Houston uh, most of my life. I went to school here, um, recently uh, got my certificate in coaching from Rice. Um, along with that, I'm a mom of two teenagers and um, have been working from home for the past uh, year uh, with uh, frequently going into work as well. So, you know, uh, I think I've been dealing with whatever everybody else is dealing with outside of, uh, outside of my own home. So before we get into the topic, I just wanted to frame what self-care really means. And um, what are the attributes that lead um, for us to start thinking about self-care? So self-care is what people do for themselves to establish and maintain health and to prevent and deal with illness. And it is a broad concept encompassing hygiene, nutrition, lifestyle, environmental factors, and of course, the socioeconomic factors, 
income and cultural beliefs and self-medication. And one misconception I wanna clear up from the get-go is self-care is not synonymous with self-indulgence or being selfish. Self-care means taking care of yourself so that you can be healthy, you can be well, you can do your job, you can help others, you can take care of your families and meet all those hundred obligations that we have. And when do you think about self-care? When does one really think about the fact that I'm in constant burnout, I really need to step back from this and start taking care of myself? And some of the signs, you know, our body starts telling us right away. When you start feeling burnout, you're starting to feel overwhelmed. You start losing joy in things that really brought you joy. You're exhausted and fatigued, and you start having those sad days that you just can't shake off. And when you start feeling detachment from friends and family and work, you know, we've always used burnout to frame work. I'm burnt out of the job I'm in. I'm burnt out of the department. But we can get burnt out from our everyday home life as well. And COVID has shown us that as mothers and caretakers, as fathers, we're working, you know, 24 seven. Um, sometimes there's no end to the day, the day job. And then with that, you're also taking care of the family. The kids are right around you. You know, there are days where I'm on my computer on a, a work meeting and I can see my son across the hall um, working um, from homeschool. And same thing with my daughter. So, you know, it COVID has really added on you know, there were times that I would say, oh, I would love to be a, you know, a remote worker. I would love to work from home. But now I can see how challenging that is. And hats off to the mothers that are doing this all day, day in, day out for many years. Full-time uh, at-home parents feel burned out as much as women or men that are working outside of the home. Day-to-day -day vigor of taking care of your home, the kids, family obligations can cause burnout as well. You're the caretaker that's taking care of everything around. And so who takes care of you? Since COVID, parents are feeling burnt out in an exaggerated routine when every day feels like a continuation from the day before. It's like Groundhog Day that never ends. You're working, you're managing, and nothing can be turned off. So from that, what does self-care mean? It means different things to different people. Self-care may be an activity that we really do deliberately. And I wanna emphasize the word deliberate. It's when we recognize that we are not functioning the way we normally do. And we deliberately take time to take care of ourselves. And it means something very different to different people. For some, it may be going for a walk. For some, it may be taking a whole day off to do something that makes you happy. For some, it may just be praying or cooking or baking or watching a sad movie or watching a fun movie. So it's not something that we all need to say, well, my friend does self-care and that means she has spent the day out and got a massage or whatever. I just may wanna go for a walk. So I'm gonna break down self-care into three categories, spiritual, emotional, and physical. From the spiritual aspect of self-care, sometimes you just need to disconnect from worldly things and connect at a spiritual level with God, Allah, the universe, whatever you wanna call it. You need to take time maybe to pray or meditate you may wanna cry your heart out in prayer. You may wanna let go of your fears, anxiety or pain and look to a higher uh, being. Research has repeatedly shown that mindfulness and meditation and relaxation techniques can help moderate the influence of stress. Companies now are offering employees classes on the art of meditation and also giving them time to meditate during the day because it helps lower anxiety and helps lower stress. Let's move over to the emotional aspects of self-care. Emotional self-care is described as caring for one's emotional needs. 
Once you learn how you can handle your thoughts and feelings, you can get through many situations. An emotional self-care routine helps you ground and stabilize your personal energy. And science has proven that the state of our mind has an immense effect on our health and well-being. Yet so few people know how to work the muscles that build emotional intelligence and really nourish the soul. When you know or you can feel your emotions are getting out of control, when you know to realize and recognize that and step back and say, you know what, I need to take a minute for myself or I need to go for a walk before I make that decision or I'm just going to sit and have a glass of water and calm myself down before I go into that meeting or go into that parent-teacher conference. That's emotional self-care. And my last point on physical self-care is it includes how you really fueling your body. How much sleep are you getting? How much physical activity are you, do, are you getting? Are you caring for your physical needs? Are you taking a walk? Are you getting enough vitamin D and going outside and maybe getting some sunlight during the day? I found myself recently being in meetings from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. I'm zooming from one to another to another all day and I haven't seen the light of day. And I feel exhausted just being in front of a computer screen all day. And I have to force myself to get up, go outside and just sit down outside, have a glass of water, 10 minutes tops. But I come back inside and I already feel rejuvenated and I feel like, okay, I can continue with my day. But are we making those thoughtful decisions to stop and get away and, you know, close that laptop screen? How can you use self-care to rise from challenges? COVID has shown us that we are in a very challenging time. We're in anxious, we're in fear. We don't want us ourselves getting sick. We don't want our parents getting sick. We don't want our kids getting sick. You know, do I have to make that grocery run? Will I be safe? Will I get sick when I get back? You know, all those things are kind of floating around in your head. The only thing you can do and you have control over is yourself and your reaction. And that's the basis of emotional intelligence. When you realize that you're burnt out and you're exhausted and your cup is empty and you really don't have anything to give to anyone. And until you don't refill your own cup, you won't be able to help anyone else. So stepping away from that and recognizing that I'm in a challenging time, I'm overburdened. And this is the time that I need to stop and introspect and take care of myself. But we are afraid of being called selfish and self-centered as women, even as men. No one wants to say, you know what, when the going gets tough, I need to take a break and self-care. How self-centered is that? So we keep ourselves going and maybe we're on fumes outwardly. We don't wanna be perceived as someone who's egotistical. So what we do is we completely de deplete ourselves. And maybe we need to stop that. Maybe as a community, we need to let a friend know that, you know what, you're burnt out. Maybe you need to take some time off for yourself. I um, wanted to share um, the story from a friend. She had, um, her father had passed away and she was going through a very hard time. And in the midst of that, she really didn't have a lot to give to anybody else, but people would visit and she was, you know, would get out of her room, wash her face and come and sit. Because how could she be perceived as being self-centered and self-absorbed when people were coming to visit her for condolences? So she had to, you know, put herself together and come outside and sit, never thinking that maybe this is the time that she needed to spend just with herself and her own thoughts. So self-care is a way to rise from challenges. When you spend time taking care of your own self, your spiritual, emotional, and physical needs, you can come back stronger and more resilient to help others. I wanna co cover some myths around self-care. So in our society, self-care is largely misunderstood. It's narrow, it's inaccurate, perceptions explain why many of us, women in particular, feel guilty about taking care of our needs. And it explains why many of us end up stumbling and feel drained and depleted. However, self-care offers a slew of benefits. 
It's nourishing our needs. So the first self-care myth I want to share is self-care is all or nothing. So sometimes we'll say, nah, if I can't have a whole day off, it's not worth it. So it's the not worth it piece. When it's thought about self-care is not just pampering. It's really trying to take care of yourself. I believe that self-care is really found in small moments of life when you choose to take a deep breath because you notice you're feeling stressed or you take 10 minutes for a quick walk or a glass of water or a warm cup of tea or when you just want to sit by your bed before you go to sleep quietly to reflect on the day. Myth two, self-care requires resources that you don't have. Self-care to some people is like, well, you know what? I can't do it. I can't afford it. it. means spending a day at the spa or a big tropical vacation. No, self-care could just be 10 minutes of mindfulness, meditation, or doing some stretching or exercising or taking a warm bath. Just simple, small practices on a daily, consistent basis. Self-care is optional, another myth. No, it's not optional, it's necessary. It's something that you wanna make a habit. Myth four, self-care is a feminine thing. No, self-care is a human thing. Just as women need it, men need self-care as well. Number five, self-care is anything that soothes you. Many people turn to alcohol, TV marathons, smartphone games, food, or to soothe their stress and unwind. But these habits are opposite of self-care. Self-care practices need to support health and wellness. They should not be addictive in nature, compulsive or harmful to your mind, body and spirit and also your bank account. Number six, we have to earn the right to practice self-care. So if I have worked an 80 hour work week, then taking a three hour lunch break and you know going and getting my nails done. I deserve it. No, that's completely wrong. Our lives are organized culturally with the emphasis that it is the first third of our lives on education, the second around career and family development and the last third on leisure. We can't have fun in our twenties. We can't be thoughtful about ourselves in our thirties. We're gonna take that you know, vacation when we're, you know, retired. No, that's not how we do it. We add happiness and taking care of ourselves throughout our lives, make it part and parcel of our lives. Number seven, practicing self-care means making choices between yourself and others. And this is, I think, one of the myths that you know really defines us as women. If we choose others over ourselves, we're self-centered, we're greedy, we're selfish, and we hate to be called any of those three. No, actually, when we are not taking our care of ourselves, we end up in a cycle of deprivation in which our activities can deplete our energy and our, our emotional reserves. And so we become frustrated and cranky. And we look to others to nourish our needs and replenish those reserves and they don't have the answers that we have for ourselves. So what we need to do is stop making a choice between ourselves and others, take care of ourselves. So in turn, we can take care of others. So I'll end here and I'll turn it over to Amna. Hello everyone, my name is Amna Hawk. Uh, it's so nice to be here. Uh, thank you, Umhani and Dr. Naima Shah for uh, telling us everything about the myths. And I'm going to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Shah was saying about self-care. And I'm going to share some tips on how you can practice self-care, not just for adults, not just for moms or dads, but also for teens, because I know there's lots of teens out there, young children out there that may need some ideas on how to practice self-care. Because just like Dr. Shaw was saying, in our communities, 
we do tend to shame women, men, children for wanting to practice self-care and we have to break that. And I want to give some of those tips to children, to teens, uh, and to adults on how to do that and how to take care of yourself first. But yeah, I didn't introduce myself. So, so my name is Amina and I'm a licensed social worker with Anissa Hope Center. I am a therapist. I focus on trauma-focused therapy and strengths-based uh, therapy with, with domestic violence and family violence victims with Anissa. And I have a background working with juveniles in the justice department, as well as foster care children in the system. And I'm very passionate about social justice and different topics that I've been uh, advocating for for the past 15 years that I've been a social worker. Um, so going over those tips, the 10, the 12 tips, I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible because we have Dr. Hamdan that's going to be going after me and she's my mentor. She's my director at Anissa and I absolutely love her. So I want to listen to her as well, but I, I'm going to quickly go over this. So the first thing about self-care, the number one thing that you have to do is carve out time. And we don't carve out time for ourselves. We think carving out time for ourselves to do something is wrong. Sometimes we are made to feel that way by our family members, by our children, by our parents. And that's a basic prerequisite for just about all the ways to take care of yourself. You need time and it has to be a part of our daily routine. It's not always easy to set time aside with everything that's going on in our life, but learning to carve it into our daily schedule is so important. So if we start it, if I'm gonna to talk to the teens, if you start now, it's gonna become a habit. And many of the activities that I'm gonna be talking about don't require a lot of time. Sometimes it only takes 15 to 20 minutes in your day and it's the regularity that counts, the consistency that counts. So like Dr. Shaw was mentioning, meditation and deep breathing. Meditation and deep breathing, we've come a long way from believing that meditation is just hocus pocus, right? Because that's what people used to believe. Oh, people are meditating and they're just, I don't know what they're doing, it makes no sense. But mindful meditation has proven to change the structure and the function of the brain. And it's a fabulous way to promote relaxation while reducing anxiety, depression, and stress. It can be learned in person with an expert or online. There's so many YouTube videos out there, instructional videos on your smartphone apps. There's one app that I actually use, which is the Calm app. I do that every night, or uh, the nights that I remember. But even me, being a therapist, I have to use it. And it takes two to three minutes. And it just, it's amazing what these, we have all this technology, let's use it, right? Uh, so this is something that you can do anytime, any place, whenever you need it. Uh, okay, so number three, yoga. Yoga and exercise, that's three and four. Those are the uh, tips that I'm gonna give you next. So yoga and other types of Eastern methods of activity involve stretching, improving flexibility, connecting the mind and body, all of which are helpful for stress reduction and wellness and have been used extensively for thousands of years. And you can learn those through online videos. You can get a professional to help you, but there's YouTube. And I know everybody uses social media and YouTube and all these things out there. We have so much accessibility to things like this, like yoga and exercise. And the exercise, let's go into exercise. Working out comes in many forms. There's training for strength, there's endurance, there's aerobic activity, getting your heart beat up, but simply just walking two miles a day, like Dr. Shaw was saying, go out and take a walk, get some vitamin D and just get outside. Exercise doesn't only get you physically fit, but it's a natural way to help decrease depression and anxiety. And it releases endorphins and all those happy chemicals in your body. So just try to do something small every day with exercise. You can do videos at home as well. It's not something that you have to, if you, you're scared about COVID and you're stressed out, maybe try something at home. Number five, get some sleep. I know people, sleep is a huge when it comes to self-care. It is an amazing form of self-care because the problem is we don't get enough sleep. It's easier said than done, I know, but sleep deprivation is detrimental to a person's thinking and their physical and emotional state. So most young people need eight to nine hours of restful sleep to function at their best. It's not easy fitting this into your schedule, especially with all of the academic and social and recreational activities but it has a huge payoff y'all. It really has a huge payoff. Try to have, try trying to have a regular sleep schedule as possible. 
you'll generally find yourself much happier in the morning, your anxiety levels decrease. And once you start doing it consistently, your biological clock will just try to, will start remembering it and you'll fall asleep and you'll wake up at, a, at the same time every day if you start practicing right now. So number six, creative expression. Creative expression means different things to everyone. So choose a creative outlet to convey your thoughts and feelings. This could be journaling, writing poetry, painting, drawing, doing photography, anything that brings out your creativity. The key here is channeling your emotional state through an art form. While some may choose to do this seriously and take lessons, but there's so many self-taught taught artists of all kinds, they also get the job done. Uh, and I don't want you to strive for perfection because we're not meant to be perfect, but simply just immersing yourself in a creative art form can ward off a lot of adverse thoughts and feelings. So I'm going to share one of mine, journaling, like I mentioned, I love to journal. I, I wish I would do it more consistently, but I don't, but it is, whenever I do it, I feel so much better. And I know it's, it's, it's easier said than done, but you have to find that creative expression that you click with, that you, that speaks to you. And it could be anything that just brings out that you and you, right? Um, okay, number seven, I think we're on, we're almost done. Uh, so play with a pet. I'm not a huge pet person, but my kids are. They love cats, they love dogs. And if your parents aren't allowing you to buy a, a cat or get a cat or go get a dog, it's okay. You can ask your parents to take you to the zoo or take you to PetSmart and you can play with the pets there or go to a, you know, there's so many places like there's pet shelters, but this is, a, people that own pets know that this is such a huge way to foster self-care uh, and cuddling with a pet, taking care of them and feeling their unconditional love is something that we rarely experience on a consistent basis. So go out, Play with a pet, make yourself feel better, okay? Number eight, meet and communicate with friends. And I know this has been so tough for this past year. It's been difficult for all of us, but there's ways. Like we're talking here on Zoom, right? We're here on Facebook Live, we're engaging with one another. Maybe have one of those things with your friends where you're meeting with each other online. I know you're online all day because of virtual learning, but there are ways, especially now that the vaccines are coming out, there's masks, always mask up, but there are ways. And, you know, the research has found that meeting with peers and talking about what's going on with you, including past events that you're still processing in your brain, prevents burnout and promotes well being. So, group connections are so important for fostering resilience and releasing chemicals in the brain that support well-being. And the activities don't always have to be just talking, things like doing art projects together. So maybe your creative expression, you can do that with a group or your friend. Or if you wanna do it online, maybe, uh, I know that teenagers and kids are playing a lot of games lately, right? So there's Dungeons and Dragons, there's slime, there's gaming, maybe you can do that online with one of your friends. Uh, and, you know, despite the pressure of having to have a huge number of friends or followers, it only takes a few special friends to make a difference in your life. I cannot emphasize on that enough. You only need one or two people in your lives to make yourself feel better. And I know that a lot of us don't have that, but I'm gonna go into how you're gonna love yourself too. So try to have that deeper connection with your mom or your dad or your sibling if you don't have friends, because I know that it's hard finding friends right now. And I know a lot of us may be introverted as well, but group connections foster well being. Okay, number nine, appreciate nature. Uh, like she had said, walk outside, take that walk. But you know, there's a reason why we as Americans and as just humans treasure our state and national parks. We treasure our waterways, we treasure our beaches. We just, I want you to think of the last time you went out to the beach and you saw that beautiful sunrise or that beautiful sunset. You played, you rode your bike to the park or you took a scenic hike or you played in snow. This past two weeks ago, I know it was crazy and people, a lot of people are traumatized, but just going out and playing with snow helped my children. They were excited about it and it was, it was fun, but just doing things outside, taking a walk in your neighborhood. These are things that you start connecting with nature and you connect with your, with the outside world. It just makes you feel better. This is how, I mean, this is how we connect with the, with the world. Number 10. I know Dr. Shaw had mentioned this, I'm gonna quickly go over it, but turn off your smartphones. This is just, 
I'm speaking to myself too. I'm not just speaking to the kids out there or the moms out there. I'm speaking to myself. It's honestly, I went on a Facebook uh, detox last year for about three to four months. And it was like the best three to four months ever. And it's so hard for me to do now because I'm, you know, I, I'm doing so many different things. But just taking that break for a few months helped me a lot. And it does help because we don't need it constantly because it's stitched to my side, I know. And I know it's stitched to a lot of your sides as well. We can take a break, even if it's for just a part of our day. Uh, and there's going to be some withdrawal and anxiety about not being right there for what you think is the most critical thing in the world. But how many text, Instagram stories, or other digital communications do we really need to see immediately? So th there's very few, right? Uh, so once you try it, you actually might find it re refreshing to have a break from the constant notifications. And I am a testament to this. I will say it over and over again. It was the most liberating three months of my life. <laughs> okay. We're almost done. Uh, do something for someone else. Number 11. This is something that I'm so passionate about. Doing something for someone else. Our brains are wired for giving people. Everybody, we are wired to give. In fact, the chemicals released by the brain during the process of giving is far more rewarding than when we receive gifts. Joining in even small local efforts such as community centers, soup kitchens, geriatric life centers, children's hospitals, or after-school programs all foster that feeling. And reality is that you are making a positive impact on another person's life. This is something, it's, you're not just benefiting others, you're benefiting yourself too. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. It is such a beautiful thing to be able to give. It's such a privilege to be able to give. So if you have that privilege, please use it, please. Last one, number 12, one of my other favorite ones, daily positive affirmations. And I know Dr. Hamdan's probably like thinking, okay, yeah, she does those with her clients all the time because I do. I'll be sitting there with my clients and I'll, I will make them write out their positive affirmations and I will actually say them with them. And I do this as a therapist. I mean, I come into my office and I have sticky notes on my computer saying the things that I wanna say to myself, positive things that I wanna, somebody else to say, but I'm saying them to me, to myself. So taking, talking to yourself daily in the mirror, being your own biggest cheerleader, using post-it notes, reminding yourself of your amazing qualities, affirming yourself rather than looking to others to give you that affirmation, telling yourself daily that I am amazing or anything else that you have negative thoughts about, changing those negative core beliefs into positive ones. Basically, I'm trying to tell you to fake it till you make it. Through through training your brain into believing those positive core beliefs. For instance, for me, I come in and I read my note saying, I am my own best friend. I am amazing. I can accomplish anything. These are things I, I am fearless because you know, we all carry some fears. But when I tell myself I am fearless and you keep saying that over and over and over again for several months, your brain is getting trained. Just like we've trained our brains when somebody tells us, like for somebody tells you you're fat, oh, look at you, you're so fat. But if you go back and you tell yourself every day in the mirror, I am slim, I am beautiful. You're training your brain to believe that positive affirmation. So we have to be our own biggest cheerleader. So if you don't have that friend out there, be your own best friend. And I know it's easier said than done, but we have to take that, we, we have to train our brains. And if we are allowing negativity be, to be put into our brains, we can allow positivity positivity to be put in our, into our brains. Uh, so, it, so bottom line, I'm going about to finish. So in all times, we need ways to help maintain our ability to cope. So self-care techniques, the ones that I gave you, are fundamental for preventing stress before it strikes. And they are fundamental for sustaining our equilibrium during these hard times. So these were just some tips that I wanted to give you to prevent stress before it strikes. So if you start doing some of these things, not all of them, but at least some of them, I promise you, it will you will start feeling better. I've done these in my own life. I'm a therapist, but I'm the first to admit that we all need self-care. And we as therapists need self-care. And teenagers need self-care. So please be your own biggest cheerleader. And we are here for you. If you want to reach out to Anissa Hope Center, reach out to us. We are here to listen to you. And I'm going to give it to Dr. Hamdan now.
I can't hear you, Dr. Hamdan. I'm sorry. Okay. I think she's on mute. Oh, there she is. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for unmuting me. <laughs> All right. It's great to have um, be here tonight with this amazing panel. You know, the information that was shared both by Umhani, thank you for sharing your personal story, and Nima, you know, the myths, those are spot on. And I love that you covered that self-care is more than just, you know, getting a massage or doing something, you know, um, that requires some type of material consumption. And Amna, the tips were, you know, we can never hear, we, we constantly need the reminders, especially about the mindfulness. And, you know, um, just to introduce myself, I am a licensed therapist. Um, in addition to that, I am the development director at Anissa. So Amna and I do work together. So sometimes I hear her in her office giving these positive affirmations to her clients. And I'm like, wow, she got me motivated through the, through the walls. Now, what I wanna talk about is if something a bit different that hasn't been touched on. And it's actually something that I have noticed from my clients. And the question that I always ask is that, you know, they come in, they're stressed, they've gone through a divorce, a breakup, a loss, and I give them all this great advice and then they don't use it. And so I'm going to talk about three different things today. I'm going to talk about what's really happening to, that impacts people, someone from not actually being able to uh, engage in self-care. What's the difference between self-care and avoidance and some of the do's and don'ts. Now, something I noticed from my clients is that, you know, no one wants to neglect themselves. We don't go around saying, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do self-care. It's not a conscious decision. So, and a lot of times, so then I was like, okay, if we don't want to neglect yourself and we're not taking care of ourselves, why are they not doing something as simple as, you know, doing something relaxing or, or you know, just at least balancing their physical well being, their spiritual well being, or their, you know, emotional well being? And what I realized is that it all comes down to self worth. That when they actually do not believe they're worthy and their self sense of self esteem is quite low, you can give them all the remedies and the formulas and the, and the you know, there's a self care wheel. They're not going to use it because the, their core beliefs is I'm not enough or I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy of this. And so the clients that I, you know, I talked about, I had a client who you know, had gone through a divorce and was, you know, had two kids and was working full time job was basically she was on, on end rope was on burnout. And at the time when she came in, we tried to kind of in parallel to doing the work, I wanted to give her some things to kind of cool down, but she couldn't do any of it. Three months into it, when we started working on her core beliefs around her self-worth and her self-esteem and her confidence building, she then was slowly able to start doing one or two of the, the self-care things that we did. So, you know, it's not a time, a lot of times people tell you, oh, I don't have the time, I don't have the money or I don't have the energy. But in reality, those are all excuses. If someone's not actually actively doing something, if they've been given the tools, there's something deeper that needs to be dealt with. And that's what I've learned in my practice is that, you know, you know who wants to neglect themselves? Who wants to go around saying, hey, you know what? I want to actually not take care of myself. <laughs> it's very few people. So often, you know, with friends or family, if they're not taking care of themselves and they're not able to practice self-care, maybe we need to just be a curious and actually try to start figuring out what we can do to kind of get underneath and actually talk to them about some of their issues. Now, the other thing I want to talk to was the difference between avoidance or pseudo self-care. And a lot of times people think that they're doing self-care, but in reality, it's more of an avoidance. And so pseudo self-care is basically numbing or avoidance, or you're usually doing something to avoid a difficult situation. It's kind of like procrastinating in a way. It's like all of a sudden you're cleaning your house because you don't want to do an assignment. Um, now, I'm going to give you a chart to kind of give you an example of what this would look like you know, a self-care, this or that. So a scoop of ice cream could be self-care. You know what? I'm not going to worry about this. Now, if you're eating the actual gallon, you know, there's probably something that's not self-care. <laughs> that's, you know, self-neglect and actually uh, numbing. If you're doing a bit, little bit of on social media, 30 minutes a day, one hour, that's okay. But if you're doing hours on Netflix and binge watching TV, um, probably not self-care. You know, if you're cleaning a closet, Great, cleaning can, I actually tell clients that are depressed, get up and clean something. It's a great way to feel better. But if you're becoming OCD and cleaning out all your closets at once, not self-care. If you're going for a walk, very healthy. But if, you know, I have clients that, you know, I call it anore anore anorexia, where they actually start exercising excessively. Um, it's not anorexic, it's not, they're not anorexic, but they're using exercise as a form of anorexia. So if you're getting up early versus kind of snoo pressing the snooze button and kind of sleeping in a lot. so 
the line is, you know, the line can be blurred sometimes because I have clients where they're like, you know, I am, you told me to practice self-care. And so, you know what? I told myself, I'm not going to do anything today. I'm just going to chill and do and lay in bed all day. You know, every now and then we need one of those days, but if you're doing that two or three days out of the week and you have a pile of stuff at it, that's not self-care. So, you know, but at the end of the day, it's a good insight that if you are avoiding, then that means most likely there's some underlying issues that we have to kind of discuss and kind of get under. Um, in terms of the do's and don'ts, you know, I'm gonna echo what everyone has been talking about here tonight. You know, self-care is not a luxury. And for some reason it's perceived that way. It's like, oh, well, when I get around to it, but in reality, if you're not doing self-care, you actually can't kind of show up for everyone in your life. And so don't put off your self-care, do work on your self-esteem and your self-worth. Don't believe, you know, self-care is about lots of time. Sometimes, you know, some of the examples that were given by, um, you know, both ladies earlier were take five to 10 minutes. It doesn't require like an hour, 10 hour thing. You know, the few things that you can do, just taking time out for yourself. Don't try to do self-care alone sometimes. You know, sometimes you can actually engage a partner or a friend, you know, going out with friends can be a form of self-care. And, you know, the last one that I mentioned earlier was also talked about, you know, about balancing it, you know, having doing spiritually self-care, social self-care, as well as, you know, you can do the massage, the nails and the shop, and those all help, but those are very temporary if you're not balancing the other parts of your life. So I kind of just touched on those really quickly. Um, in summary, you know, self-care is, it's multifaceted. There's many components to it. A lot of times, you know, the media was talking about kind of the physical aspect of it, but the real part that, you know, is really critical is the emotional aspect of it, as well as the social and the spiritual aspect. So, you know, something like not getting into a fight with somebody, that's a form of self-care. Because you, anything that disrupts your peace is, is going to, is, is not self-care. So, just pay attention to how you're feeling. So if you're arming yourself or putting boundaries or walking away from something unhealthy, that's a form of self-care. Avoidance, make sure though that you're paying attention to the difference between self-care and I'm avoiding. If you're binge eating, it's probably not self-care. If you're spending hours and hours on social media, it's probably not self-care. So just, you know, the, the lines are blurred and we have to kind of be honest with ourselves. We know the truth if we're willing to kind of check in with ourselves. Now, in terms of the, you know, the last third point is that, you know, self-care is not a luxury. It's a necessity. We, all, we do need it in terms of to kind of be more effective in, in terms of how we show up in life, whether as, a, you know, as a single person, a married person, a mom, a professional, it's just, it's quite important. Um, and one thing, you know, I will leave you with a thought of like, make sure, you know, from this presentation, if there was, you know, if you can write it in the comments or in the notes, if there was one thing that you were going to do, what's one thing that you would do for, uh, for self-care? Thank you for your time and hope that didn't bore you too much. I'll give it back wow. to you, Manny. Wow, that was amazing and I'm totally inspired. I have so many different ideas and wow, thank you so much, ladies. You guys had amazing, amazing advice for all of us. And um, I think we all need to do this, not only for ourselves, but for our family and everybody around us who depend on us. So that we can give the world the best of us, not what is left of us at the end of the day, for sure. Um, we, are, um, we are going to ask the audience on Facebook if anybody has any questions. We have one. Um, it is for all the speakers. How do you practice self-care personally? Who would like to take it first? Hey, so, okay. So I'll go first, practicing self-care. So there's lots of ways that I practice self-care. So like I had mentioned, I like to journal. Uh, I like reading and I do these things when I can get away from my kids. Sometimes just an act of self-care for me is going into my closet <laughs> and just sitting there with my book behind my clothes. This is, this, I know it may seem weird, but it's an act of self-care. I love doing it. It actually gives me peace. When I'm in there with my, my book and my kids can't find me for five, 10 minutes, it's, it's self-care. And these are little things that we can do. And honestly, there's so many other things that I, I probably do for self-care. Like I go out and I'll eat at a restaurant by myself. I watch movies at the movie theater by myself. I try to enjoy time with me because I'm my best friend. I have to be in my body 
all the time in my brain all the time. So I enjoy watching movies without anyone. I enjoy uh, eating at a nice restaurant by myself. Uh, and I know sometimes, you know, people shame you for that, but oh well, I love it. And you gotta do you. So these are things that I do. I agree with you. I like the exact same things. Um, yeah, we need to get together to do this <laughs> definitely. The next question I have is, when I practice self-care, a lot of time I feel mom guilt. Oh my God, I do that too. Can I stop that? <laughs> Dr. Naima, Dr. Ketam? How do you get rid of the mom guilt? Oh, that's a great question because I have three little ones. <laughs> mom guilt is always there. The best advice is what I would give a client is own it. It's, you know, we tell people don't feel something. I, the best thing to do is to actually, you know what, admit it. I feel guilty and that's okay. Because guilt is, becomes a wasted emotion if we try to kind of like say, no, you know, we deny it. But it's like, okay, I feel bad. But if I can do something about it, I will. And if I can't, then, you know, just acknowledge the feeling and, and, and let it be because it's, you know, it's nothing's going to do, nothing's going to change it. Wow, good. I, I echo uh, what Dr. Hamdan said and just would like to add that um, I don't take it as mom guilt because I feel like I'm going to be a better mom if I am refreshed, I can listen more, I can empathize, I can handle, uh, you know, a longer evening with them if I take 10 to 15 minutes for myself. So I feel like taking care of myself makes me a better mom to come back and, you know, be the best I can for them. Um, and if I am exhausted or if I'm tired, I can feel being cranky and short and irritated, um, which is not the best version of the mom I want to be. So um, I don't think it's guilt. I just think it's, you know, taking care of myself so I can take care of them. Yeah, I totally agree on that. That's a great point. I think perfect, perfect advice. I have one more question. What do I do about toxic friends that make me, um, that don't make me feel my best? Ugh. <laughs> I can't answer that. With them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know, lately, the you know, I constantly seen these things where like, you know, pay attention to the, the top three people you hang out with because you become like them. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain people if they're toxic, you can't get rid of them out of your life, but you can minimize. And the other thing is to, to realize that you, you do get influenced no matter how much you try to pretend that you don't. So if they are toxic and you're aware of that, just reduce your interaction. And if you have to stay interacting with them, keep it at a minimum. Yeah. And I'll jump in and mention, I'll just kind of piggyback on what Dr. Hamdan said. Uh, there's some people that you can't get away from. Like if it's family members, it's sometimes you're gonna have to see them, right? But like she said, minimize interaction with even family members and it's okay. We don't need to shame anyone in minimizing interaction with family members and people will, but you have to take care of yourself first. But with friends, I want you to understand with friends, it's, especially I'm speaking to kid, teenagers, toxic friends are one of the reasons why so many teenagers are going through anxiety and depression and toxic friends, you have to find a group. You will find one friend that is good. If you have a huge group of friend, friends and they're saying bad things to you and you feel like they're not good for you or find that one in that group and kind of interact with them more. And you have to start, stop cutting, cu cutting them out because friends are not people that you have to live with for the rest of your life. You will find better friends. And especially if I have clients that talk to me about body shaming, there's friends out there that body shame that will say, why are you eating this? Why do you look like that? Those friends, I know it's easier said than done. I keep saying that phrase, but drop those friends, drop them. Like you would drop any, I mean, I'm seriously drop them because those friends are not for you. And friends are people that you can drop family are ones that you may have to have interaction with sometimes but you will find that one best friend. And I'm a testament to it. I had toxic friends all my life and I found good friends. You will, and a, a God or somebody, the higher being will find somebody for you. So do that for yourself, okay? I just wanted to add on the toxic um, friends. You know, through our lives, 
people come into our lives that may be toxic and not good for us and friends that we had in our 20s, maybe not the ones we want in our 30s and our 40s. So taking evaluation of your friend group every now and then is a good idea because you want to make sure the people that you are letting into your lives and spending time with you are the best for you. And sometimes that doesn't happen. And it's okay. Sometimes a good thing may need to end just because it's not good for you anymore. And the other thing I wanted to add was realizing that someone is toxic is step one. And sometimes when you know this person is toxic, then their advice, their friendship, their information, you know to keep at an arm's distance. And so realizing that this person is not, you know, in the best for you is probably the best thing for yourself. I know this person comes like this, you know, every time I talk to this friend, it's an hour of like me feeling bad about myself. And so then I know I need to have a game plan for that. I've got to go. I can't talk right now. Busy. I'll catch you later. Also, social media can be toxic as well, you know, in itself. Everybody's having a great time out there and I'm stuck at home. We all go through that. And so minimizing some of that social media um, also is really helpful. Thank you so much. I love the advice about social media. I think I'm definitely going to try it on. It is I think sometimes you just need time away from everything out there. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. And thank you to Dr. Naima, Ms. Samina, and Dr. Katem for your amazing advice. And all of us are really excited to go and try this. And thank you for Anissa for organizing this fabulous talk. And um, the community is lucky to have an organization like you to take care of themselves. And um, all the amazing activities also done by Project RISE are a uh, result of collaboration with other organizations and individuals. And we are always looking for new partners. So please reach out to us via Twitter at Project Rise DB and at Daudibora underscore USA. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you.